Hello! Now, I realise I haven't done one of these comment response videos in a while, and that's entirely on me. I'm going to try and get some done in the next week or so. And I do apologise. But this particular series has produced such a lot of comments, and I'm fairly sure the Battle Atlantic episodes, when they come out at... will start coming out in about 13 minutes are going to produce even more. I thought I would start by going through the ones prior to Battle Atlantic. Because I'm going to announce now, if this is timed right and I manage to get this recorded right, this will come out see, the same day as the, uh, the redo of the Battle Atlantic. And the original will come out the next day. So you'll see what the original version of Battle Atlantic was going to look like. And a redo of it. What a fun. Anyway, so the first topic was, of course, the Navalist. And now this one creates some interesting responses. It really does. So I'm moving my screen just a tad. And let's go through the comments. From the bottom to the top. So, from the last to the first. The first to the last. Well, Wayne Boren, I hope it was a good day. Now, Steve Winch, makes note of self. After he's feeling fine and refreshing the rest of his vacation, wind up Dr. Clark by mentioning the R class. Now, John South has responded to this, and this is where there's a question. Steve Winch, you might not work by mentioning the R class. Considering the fears over oil supply during time of war, as the global oil supply in 1914 was very different than that in 1939, the idea of having a coal-powered 15-inch gunship makes sense for the time. As in 1914, there was a genuine fear that during wartime they might not be able to get enough oil for the QEs. At no point did I say they didn't have to be coal-powered. I said... A small tube boilers. And actually, I'd like the QEs to be in small tube boilers. You can get coal-powered small tube boiler ships. They are slightly rarer because by the time that actually navies really start, well, the Royal Navy starts pushing into small tube boilers, and most navies do. Oil power, oil supply has got far more prevalent. Prevalent, but you can do it. After all, that's what most steam trains were. And my main problem with the R-Class is just that it feels such a step back. You could have done them coal-powered, and they could have still been a step forward. Halbeck. The R-Class, or as some would call them, the Queen of the Class, if it was designed by an accountant. Mm-hmm. They're great. You probably answered this question. The que they wanted six. Treasury went, nope, four. They got eight, but the Treasury made... Certain the funds were, as they would say, somewhat lacking. Not quite. In a prescient version of what happened to this day, the Royal Navy tried to appease the Treasury by making them as basic as they could while still being fifteen a reasonable fifteen inch armed ships for the time. In the nicest way, you're already supposed to be ordering a sixth Queen Elizabeth class. HMS Agincourt, who's, as we said, kind of interesting. And I've got it, but I'm not getting into that here. I'd have honestly gone for four of, uh, I'd have taken the Queen Elizabeth Hull, Queen Elizabeth Everything, and probably gone small, coal powered small tube boilers. That would have still been advanced because I'd have been using small tube boilers. Yes, they're not quite as good as when they're oil oil fueled, but as your coal power for those who are worrying about coal supply, which as was a reasonable thing. So, whilst I would prefer them to be oil supplied, oil powered, life happens though. All right, Damon. 
What was the working relationship like between Church and Fisher as the Titus the Admiralty? Any chance of video? I will do a video on at some point. Um, they were good to begin with. When would Church be considered a better first order Admiralty? Was it the start of World War One or the start of World War Two? World War One, because in World War Two he doesn't remember the lesson that actually the war doesn't does last longer, and he also, as I said. Lord Cork and Ori. Yes, I know there are lots of people going, but you can't hold it against the man. He also points to Mountbatten. So, you know, somehow, for some reason, with some naval officers, Churchill just doesn't seem past the uniform. Barry Gus book is good, and I will get around to looking at it sometime. Dave Brennan, uh, the Irish question, India pinning the pound to gold standard. Mm, I can sort of broadly speaking bring one of those into naval history, but honestly, with having quite as many Scottish and Cornish and various other variations on Celtic relatives as I have, me on the Irish question gets a bit muddy because it becomes family politics at a certain point, so I tend to steer clear of it, despite this lovely accent. Um, right. Bon, Bill Bond, Revenge class, 2.4 million. Queen Elizabeth class, 3 million. 4 for the price of 3. Extra speed, not so important when the enemy is Germany. Then supercharged 350. Thank you, you answered my question before I asked it. Sue Aviator. I think Dr. Clark is right that the R-Class wasn't the best idea, but neither do I think it's a terrible idea. I think... the point, and My point about the R-Class is it's a good idea, poorly executed in that just because you it, it doesn't even matter if you do use the less spoilers and all those things you don't have to build such a cramped design it's not that much shorter you're not saving that much money in hull and armor plate versus the queen elizabeth and as we've been over before actually a longer hull with the same beam Tends to give you a more efficient fuel in uh, fuel design and more efficient fuel and uh, more efficient fuel and more efficient for uh, slightly higher speed and all these sort of things and gives you more space generally. Here's the thing: I think the R class could have been a very useful design. The trouble is, they were cramped. Then you look at the difference in length between them and the Queen Elizabeth class. It's not that massive. The Queen Elizabeth class come in at roughly 196 meters overall. The R-Class come in at 189 meters overall. The R-Class have a beam of 27 meters. The Queen Elizabeth class, 27.6 meters. You want to provide a future-proofed R-Class you are talking, and this is a equivalent to a Queen Elizabeth class. Seven meters in hull length and 0.6 meters in beam. This is the point when, an, uh, when someone who specializes in naval history starts to talk about future proofing and ship design. We're not talking about the initial engine fit. We're not even talking about the initial weapons fit. We're talking about the hull. Hull strength, hull life expectancy, hull size. Those are the things that are your limitations on life of a ship. And those are like when I'm talking about aircraft carriers. What do I always mention is the limitation of an aircraft carrier? It's the size of the hangar. That is what's going to control your aircraft, because the size of the hangar, the size of the lifts, and the size of the aircraft are what's going to dictate your aircraft size. Not your dreams, not your aspirations, not your needs of your operations. What you can actually fit on the ship is what's going to dictate that ship's abilities. Unless you are prepared to cut your aircraft carrier down the middle and sew in another section. And I say so because whilst it's going to be a lot of welding, there is also going to be a lot of things inside which are going to have to be cables and wires and stuff which are going to have to be hooked up. So 
Here comes, in a way, thread and needle. It's the same with a battleship. And you don't want to do that with armor plate. So what matters is how big you build it to begin with. If we think about it, in the 1920s and 30s, the Queen Elizabeth class, yes, they were starting from a higher speed, so their engine, but the broadly speaking, it was the space. Here's the really dirty secret about the R class. As we know, they have a slightly better armor shaping and operations than the Queen Elizabeth class. If they'd had more space in their design, even if they'd had less stuff in there, that space had been used for storing shells and ammunition or whatever the space had been used for, carrying more fuel, they'd have probably been the better ships to refit and repair rather than the Queen Elizabeth class. Because if you'd been able to shift them over the small tube boilers, or especially if they started off with coal-fired small tube boilers and you just change them from coal to oil, New furnace, new burners, new tube, and new boilers. Woof! Just watch the speed go up. There are lots of options which I've forgotten with these ships. Andrew Reynolds and Aldrich, thank you for the comment. And Andrew Reynolds, the old design of boiler makes me think they possibly designed this to take boilers they already had in stock or in production. Nope, they had to order them. That would save a lot of time as one of the longer lead items on ships. Still, that makes me think it might be better to build more QEs with the said boilers that are substituted. The boilers could have been upgraded later on after the war, if necessary. It makes you wonder what World War II and the interwar upgrade schedule would look like had there been 10 QEs and 3 renown class. Well, let's be honest, if you'd been building more QEs instead of the R class, then the Renown class, or the if the R class had been evolutions of the QEs, the Renown class would have been evolutions of those ships being constructed. It would have been a battle cruiser based on a modified or improved Queen Elizabeth design. Um, Paul from Chicago, any suggestions on where to look to find Elizabeth feedback? Uh, theory board. Uh, DK Brown puts the R's at 22. Admiral Charles Madden uh, called them the wettest ships in the fleet in letter to any court. Hmm. Interestingly, in Warships International 1990, number one, Madden's letter states A turret and revenge useless ahead in C state 5 to 6. Yeah, we need more on, uh, more on this Churchill topic. Uh, we, there will be more on this Churchill topic. Seneca, so, this style of video with just one slide might actually be an improvement over the other videos with lots of slides because it flows more naturally. In this case, a second slide with a picture of an R class and a QE would have been cool, but sometimes less slides are more. I might do an actual straight up comparison between an R class and a QE and talk about what the variations could have been if you're all interested. Um, student Aviator. Hi, Dr. Clark. Um, this I actually replied to in the comments, but I'll do uh, talk about it again. Hi, Dr. Clark. Uh, when you say the R class ship was terrible, are you being completely serious or a bit hyperbolic? Because whilst it appears this wasn't the best decision, it's still nevertheless a good idea to get more ships produced. Surely compromising to make the treasury happy so further projects could be greenlighted worth it. After all, I would rather have 8 QEs and 4 R's and updated fleet of cruiser and destroyers than 12 QEs and a neglected fleet of cruiser and destroyers. Um, I respond to this. They were building 6 Queen Elizabeths as planned. The R's were supposed to be 4. They were granted then granted 4 more. The reduction from the Amnesty's original request was 6 was what produced the saving for the cruisers. And then they actually asked for extra money. And then the Treasury then had to grant them extra money. And so anyway, thank you very much for the reply. Obviously, there are elements I need to understand better because now I'm a little confused about the decision than I was before. And my response, basically, the RM was forced to accept four, not six, on the basis that four more would be added if Germany went through with its next Navy bill. So they could have gone with four more QEs or improved QEs and then would have got four more of those when the Germans did what they did. It's escalation procurement slash defense products. Uh, basically, the RN tries to they to try and get six when the tra they know Treasury wants to reduce money. They try uh, they offer the two point four million pound vessels versus the three million pound ones. Then then forced to accept four. So the Treasury would have reduced them down by two ships, whatever. So they might as well actually pushed in for three million pound ships. The Treasury would have then been happy because they would have saved six million instead of 4.8 million. So they'd have felt really good. The RM would probably got six million for its cruiser program. 
which would have given an extra 1.2 million for cruisers and destroyers. <laughs> See, had worked. And then the Treasury would have been forced to stump up 12 million when <laughs> the Germans carried out their Navy bill. <laughs> Basically, everyone was trying to get a good uh, to, to deal with the politics of it, and I would argue they lost a chance of the strategy of it. Because yes, whilst Britain is building to fight Germany, and you have to admit that Britain also has a global empire, and so building something which is less than viable for its global empire is just not suitable. It's just not sensible. It really isn't. And yeah, we'd prefer it. We'd all prefer them to be sort of, we'd prefer the Queen Elizabeth to be about, you know, 2.8 million or less. So they could build more of them, but you know. Ah, oh, well. So let's see, what else comes through in here? Um, we'll stay on this for a second. Done the student radio to the questions. Dr. Trifonis, I don't know how, like, dislike the R class what they were, but what they represent. From this point forth, Britain will never lead in battleship design again. The R's were discounts. The Arsons were impressive on paper, but still slower than QE's. The Q KGB's were underarmed, and Vanguard was Vanguard. I love Vanguard, but you know. The aftermath of World War I saw the US taking a place alongside Britain as a dominant power. Yet, would they have been able to do so if the UK had kept innovating? The laying down of revenge, to me, marks the start of the decline of British naval supremacy. It only gets worse from there. My response to that is actually, the only possible counter to this is HMS Argencourt. In whatever form, the Clark 6 18-inch gun, or the Draconel 9 15-inch, is built. But as she wasn't, you are correct. Britain innovates on paper, but never gets the build. And it's true. Maladroit, um, hello. R class battleships, perfectly adequate for Royal Model 1, lobbing 15 inch shells in general direction of German High Sea Fleet. Thereafter, too slow for anything except being expensive convoy escorts. Tommy Estridge, that rambling intro ruins this. I do apologise. Trying to explain it all quickly. And seeing as the whole thing was 16 minutes long, for me, that's quick. This is going to be much longer answering these questions. Pat W, so let me get it straight. The QEs were the best battleships in the world at the time. The Church and the Royal Navy build ships that match the US standards in the speed. How did the R's speed compare with the Germans? Dan Freeman. I have just been looking into this on a superficial level, i.e. quickly checking stats from Wikipedia rather than digging into sources more deeply. And the simple answer is that the Germans had a fleet of more modern pre-dreadnoughts and dreadnoughts that would have, had a, uh, would have a battle line limited to probably less than 21 knots. John Evans replies to this. Dan Freeman, the British, or more accurately, Parsons, had a monopoly on steam turbines initially, so some of the first dreadnoughts of the German Navy completed with VTE, which would limit their ability to uh, vert uh, vertical triple expansion engines, which would limit their ability to maintain top speed for a long period. Our class was initially, uh, speed was initially 22 knots, but Bolgium cost 0.5 to 1 knot. Yeah. Again, small tube boilers would have made a big difference. A big, big difference. And not a massive difference in cost. Vision. No other nation built the best battleships ships they could. Then, actually, after the Sixth Connecticut Barrier Class pre drafts, the USN followed them up with the diminutive downsized version that was Mississippi and Idaho. Two little battleships quickly sold to Greece to fit their state names as super dreadnoughts. Thanks for that. Selling the two also helped pay for the third, thus making the only class with three ships by modified design. The Colorado, Colorado should have had four, but treaty. Mm. Crazy Locker. I have to wonder if the combination of Churchill's conversations uh, with his successful second bite at battleship recruitment had been thinking about a possible third bite with different logistics in the shipyard sooner than later, e.g. better boilers and bigger guns to put into the QE Class 2.0, along with refits down the line of Acquired 8. How many more iterations on propulsion was he expecting, and lead time for desired bigger guns would have made a realistic difference between the shorter time you and Drakenfell would have liked. You both have a superior understanding of the shipbuilding pipeline and overall logistics. That is why uh, that is that is within my camp capabilities here uh, in Florida. So mostly a question about your supposition and presentation. I understand your heartfelt desire to go for the gusto while the iron is hot. Churchill doesn't strike me as the type to foolishly pass an opportunity without something else, obviously, or reasons plan. Also, on the shoulder format, so far, thumbs up. Well, this is not going to be shorter format because it's going to be answering the questions. But yeah, 
Mm, to be honest, the British pipeline and available infrastructure is mahusive. It's what are you willing to spend? That's the limitation. And the British are always willing to spend more, especially this time. There is part of me, and that is the part of me that looks at HMS Agincourt, that wonders if the R-Class were the insurance option. Nice, stable, static builds, but not supposed to be around for long because they were building H. Massaging Corp. Because she's this sixth Queen Elizabeth class. And there's all sorts of other buzzing programs going on at the time. And as said, if you produce a sixth Queen Elizabeth class that is a Queen Elizabeth class with 18-inch guns, or even nine 15 inch guns. That would be such a quantum over the others, it would be scary. If you really want to be scary, you go for 12 15 inch guns, and then you basically have added 50% of a battleship of a dreadnought at the time onto each of your ships with four treble turrets. And with 15 inch guns, that's a scary amount of firepower. But, or even 8 to 18 inch guns, but then she's going to be far longer. She's not going to look like a Queen Elizabeth class. She'll have to be longer and bigger. She would have to be pretty, uh, uh, a very extended Queen Elizabeth for that one to work. That is an option, but Argencourt's never built, so we don't know. We don't know if the R's were the safety options to replace the older first generation dreadnoughts whilst you built the next generation of super dreadnoughts. So you could get them out of service as quickly as possible. But again, the fact is originally they're ordering four. And they order those four along with the sixth Queen Elizabeth. They're basically ordering five battleships a year, and they've still got them in production. At one point, I remember my Drenault, um in the Drenault, uh, list I was showing in the discussion on the channel, Britain has a huge number, double digits, under construction at any one point. That's colossal. We, we, I've talked about this in other videos. Having that capability is massive and very, very useful. And so that's the capacity they could have had. Anyway, Ian Carr. By mid-World War II, Churchill was referring to the R-Class battleships as coffin ships. John F. Evans replies. The R's didn't have the margin of space to be modernised as well as the QE, so they had to be neglected and were meant to be scrapped as the King George V came on service. Yes, as I said, a little bit longer, a little bit wider. It's the hull that matters. John Evans. How guilty or not is Churchill in the failure to get new shells prior to war? I'd say the trouble is that the shells were accepted at all levels, so you can't really blame it on Churchill, but honestly, if they'd done a lot more live firing, they might have noticed it. So that's funding for firing practice. Germans, of course, some would argue it's the Queen Elizabeth that was the cop-out class when you could have had a 28-knot version of the Super Lion Tiger Leopard. Mm, not really, but if you'd given them small tube boilers, it'd be amazing what capabilities you had. Dan Freeman, I'd like to offer defense to the R-Class, really, if only as devil's advocate, as counterpoint. And um, you've got a very nice star there. <laughs> you're also using Blackburn, Blackburn versus Catalina emojis. And your star goes down to, I think Churchill would approve, given his comments about the Stalin and the USSR in World War II. Very simple, the R-Class were a quick win replacement for the 10 times 12 inch armed gun armed treadnoughts, dreadnoughts to Colossus class. To an extent, as I've already mentioned, I'd agree with that. But that only makes sense if you do build a you are building H Massage and Core as the push forward. The R-Class then worked well with the 12 or 13 inch uh, 13 and a half inch gun ships of the Orion, King George V, and Iron Duke classes to offer a fleet of 20 
slash 2021 not payable battleships to face down the German high sea fleet without tying down the QE class or requiring the battlecruisers to be added, meaning those can be used either as separate forces to overwhelm the Germans or allow the build of deployment of battlecruisers, especially the weak ones, to go out and dominate the trade lanes over surface raiders and or von Space Squadron. Which is sort of what the British did anyway. The original design with mixed coal oil propulsion is fine for a force that is really going to be limited to the North Sea home models and actually allows greater security of logistics with domestic coal production versus oil imports. Yeah. The QEs being oil fueled would allow easier expeditionary fueling away from the fixed naval basing for coal, but the battle cruisers all needed coal still, but the RN had the coaling stations to allow them to deploy anywhere. True. The R class were conceived and ordered prior to Star World One, and as with World War Two, the exact Star World One was impossible to predict. Mm, two stars here, and so the question really is: What would happen with the QE plus Argentine and subsequent ships? I'm still not sure about the shift to oil for the Iron's battle fleet without World War One. Um, Fisher reportedly did predict it down to August 1914, but he was an interesting character. He would also lived for a lot. The 12-inch gun-armed dreadnoughts can then replace the pre-dreadnoughts with their better speed and more 12-inch guns, 10 versus 4, and it's not the same recruitment current. Although for things like shore bombardment, I'm not sure the difference would be in terms of effectiveness for a 12-inch gun versus a 9.2-inch gun, as anyone on land is going to still be splattered. Yes, but it's far easier to control if you've got, and um, this is one of the problems at Gallipoli, if you have got all the same guns, you can do far more simple fire control. I'm not sure what the difference would be in terms of effect. Uh, uh, looking at the different ships, in this case, comparing HS Dreadnought with HS Lord Nelson, the difference would be that I think Lord Nelson could offer nine guns, maximum shooting in any one direction, which are a mix of 12 inch and 9.2, while Dreadnought could offer eight 12 inch, making for easier gun fire control. Okay. Well, I just added that in myself. Dreadnoughts also tend to have better underwater protection against mines, coastal submarines, and torpedo boats. I will attempt to construct a video on this with slides. I look forward to it. And I haven't even got on to some of the other aspects of the triad, hexad, nonad of firepower, speed protection, logistics, communication, XC, military history, visualized for a detailed, in depth analysis in precise Germanic style. I look forward to actually, I, I, I'm going to see if a military history visualized or something like that is going to actually pick up my lovely little sort of hexagonic nomad or nonad, whatever we're going to call it. Um, design and start taking off because I, 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 I've sent it through to Drac and I have wondered if he's going to use it or something. He might do. Sean Mack and uh, Josh, uh, I like these smaller under 45 minute sections, although I like the three and a half hour sessions. I find it hard to find the time to get through them in a single setting. Just my two cents. I'm sure others will agree, disagree. And Richard Alder, there is another idea for collaboration with this. All you historians just play one of the people involved in conversations that led to bad engineering things. And just like how you went uh, you went back and forth about the talk over the top-notch ships down to the cheapest, they can get away with. Hmm. Uh, that could be quite cool. We might do that with Jamie. And Frederico Vergo, the R-class is to confuse people to think that there are eight Queen Lizards instead of four. I think they built five Quillers of class because it's only H Massaging Corps which isn't completed. But yes, you know, to an extent, right? Uh, I don't know. It's fun. And actually, I have now spent more time answering the comments on this video than I have. actually recording the original video. That's cool. That is very, very cool. And now it's time for the next one, which is the Raw Naval Air Service. Pardon me. So, the Royal Naval Air Service. Let's see the comments on here. And there are a fair number, as again. And again, I'll sort it into newest first so that the original one is at the bottom. 
<laughs> Daniel Politics, first. Yes, you were first to watch it. Hello. Duggan. Great schemes? Yes. Implemented badly? Yes. But most of the, his schemes needed very nearly perfect execution, and we know how that happens. True. Blaine Finnett. Gave me something to think about. Thank you. That's a pleasure. That's what this is, this is supposed to do. That's what the short videos are for, and usually I don't include everything in them, and I don't include all the stuff and go into matters of detail, because I'm more trying to... There, there is a lecturing style that you occasionally use with students called the teaser lecture. And basically what you do is you give your normal lecture in a three-hour period. Let's say you've got three hours for a lecture. You give them... You talk to them for about an hour. Then it's a five-minute break. Then you talk to them for about another 55 minutes. And then it's another five-minute break. And then you talk to them for... About 30 minutes, explain the homework and all those sort of things, have a quick fire, and then in the last uh, last bit, you give them about 15 minutes of a teaser of what next week's going to be, and you introduce the reading. And so they've had their, uh, hopefully, the idea is that A, by changing the topic in the last 15 minutes, when they're not really going to be taking in much stuff anyway on the three-hour lecture, they will think about things and they will go away with it in their minds at some ideas, hopefully. They will then go and pick up the books and the reading and they'll already have questions in their head. Because here is a trick and I'm going to tell it to you all. This is something I teach students for revision. If you, let's pick a book at random. Let's pick one of the brand new books I've been sent to review. So, this is Roman Britain, Roman Conquest of Britain by Simon Elliott. And if you read a book and you just read it, it's lovely. You will read it and you will enjoy it. But if you're revising or you're looking for topics, if you read it with a question, and let's say my question is on British cavalry, if you read it with that question in mind and close the book, and then write down what you remember from inside the book. That relates to that question. It will stick in your head. It's a revision technique. And it's something we start students doing quite reg early on in university because human beings are cre uh, learn by doing. They learn by thinking about things. And doing uh, thinking is a form of doing thinking something through. If you're just reading something, you are reading it. If you're reading something while thinking about a question, while maintaining a question in mind, you're analyzing it. And when you close that book, when it's formed, you close it, and then write down what you remember, your brain will normally pick out the most important facts that you remember from that book. And nine times out of 10, those will be the important facts. So revision techniques. And teaser lectures. Um, see, wish, wish we had a bit more uh, about that seaplane. Interesting that it was being tried so early. I imagined it to take off from water on its own dime, which was a big limitation, sea state being honest. That was still impressive. Yes, it had to take off and it had to land on water. I will do a bit more on the early seaplane at some point. I want to get into them. Seneca Nero, did the RNAS use cavalry ranks? Because Air Marshal seems like it comes from the cavalry. My explanation of that is the RFC, the Army Equivalent of the RNS by World War One, although it had started out joint, did use various army ranks. And at a certain point when they combine, some ranks come from... Well, that's why you've got Air Commodore, Naval Rank, and Air Marshal, Army Rank. Because they decided Air Admiral signed, shorted to AA, which is, you know, doesn't sound that fun. Crazy Loka. Interesting times to even try to figure out aviation, let alone naval aviation. 1903, Wright's first flight, essentially others. And Charlie, uh, Charlie Taylor, that gets written out of history, uh, poorly. 
1912, first person in the parachute from a plane on purpose, Tony Janus, was piloting. January 1st, 1914, Tony Janus made first scheduled airline flight using heavier than air, plane not digital, as called today. Oddly, a Benoit flying boat from St. Petersburg to Tampa, Florida and back, twice a day except Sunday. Later that year, he became uh, a test pilot for the Curtis Company, and soon after, in 1915, training the Russians. Pilots in the World War I, famous uh, Jane Freeze and Falls, Curtis Jennies. Janus Landing is named after him, and he is, is home to the St. Pete Grand, uh, Prix, uh, Grand Prix for the Formula One fans, where he commonly uh, landed the 75 horsepower Benoit 14 flying boat next to the St. Petersburg Pier. Albert Whitted Airport, also across the landing spot he used, has a Coast Guard station and is one of the few remaining US military approved amphibious landing ramps. His other end of commercial flight, near current day MacDill Air Force Base, has another amphibious landing ramp still in use today by the military. Always interesting to see how those bits of history are intertwined after these many years. In Churchill's decision for naval aviation 1913 to 15, being a bit ambitious, was lots and lots needed to be figured out into the 20s and on. As Dr. Clark mentioned, Churchill's enthusiasm was a huge foundation for many decades of naval aviation. Even if all decisions weren't perfect, it would have been one of the aviation naysayers in this position at that particular time, how far behind would Britain have been in the 2030s beyond being? And probably speed of flying boats, they finished. Agreed. And agreed. That's the thing. <sighs> to us, it doesn't seem like a crackpot idea because we're looking at it with hindsight. From hundred uh, from a hundred years plus of flight, what they were looking at at that time was this is a crazy little. How's that supposed to help? That that's just, that's just canvas and wood. It's just yeah. what are you on about? What can it carry that's useful? They run. So basically, the point is. He was enthusiastic when other people would have, were writing off as a crazy idea. Dayburn. Yet the Blackburn Blackman was designed, built, and developed to the eternal glory to the senior service. Sometimes the stars align. I'm worried for you, David. I am. Ian Carl. RAF remained heavily under the influence of Trenchard, his ideas, and his lieutenants, even when he had retired by 1930. Mm, Trenchard and a few others. It's not just Trenchard. And you have to remember. As I was trying to say, there's a legacy of World War I in terms of psychology that it affects politics, affects British decision-making, strategic thinking for a long time after it. And the bombing force is this idea of how to win wars by, horrend by carrying out horrendous civilian casualties. That's the whole point. You're supposed to be wiping out cities. You read Gilead Duhay, he's talking about bombers carrying a hundred tons of bombs, of nerve agent bombs. It's basically war crimes. It's how they're talking about ending wars, because there's, that scene is preferable than the suffering of the trenches. Miles McCaskill. Very good listen. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Thank you. And Ben Wilson. Thank you. Very interesting. That was quick. The actual uh, video was 15 minutes, uh, so, you know, hey-ho. Let me just note down, and then we'll go on to the next topic. The tank. Now... Tank is a fun one. Tank is always a fun one. And there are lots of comments on this. Starting off with Zachary Gherkin. I always enjoy the fact that there is a tank called Lily Willy, and it amuses me that it shocks people. Kind of face. How can people be surprised? It's the British after all. Yeah. Zachary Gherkin. You'd be surprised. During my foundation years, someone drew a Little Willy, and I said, is that... That is this the little willy, uh, little willy, and literally only one person got it. Everyone else's face was priceless. So yeah, not sure, but it does make me chuckle. True, and uh, YouTube might not like the use of that, but yes, this tank is called Little Willy because of Wilhelm. Um, 
Rick Basawa, I had no idea that Churchill was tank the tank's patron. Paul from Chicago, yeah, broken clock is right twice a day. Rick Basawa, from Chicago, I hear you. I remember when Churchill died. He was honoured as a great world-class leader. He never gave up. That's the point. And here is the thing. Perhaps this is the point of Churchill. Not all his ideas are great. And all his ideas are good. But he never gives up. And he pushes forward. And sometimes he takes the ideas of other people and pushes them forward because he has boundless enthusiasm. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But enough of them did work. And those that did work have literally changed the world. Yes, you can argue tanks would have appeared no matter what, as would naval aviation, as would possibly a variation on the R class battleship. One of those was bad. Two of those, very, very useful and have changed the world. Would they have appeared at the same time, in the same pace, without someone like Churchill? Who knows? But the fact is, they did have a Churchill, and that was critical to them. So he deserves credit for that. Danny Phillips, I think tanks might have won Gallipoli, not by material effect, but by scaring less capable Ottoman units out of their trenches and defences, opening holes so the Anzacs could actually get off the beaches, forcing more cable defenders to retreat. Getting them there, though, would be interesting. As Carl Nazareth then points out, I think tanks might have won Gallipoli if the in tanks would have been able to be landed and scale the hills. That would have been the problem, getting the tanks there in the first place and scaling the hills. But, saying that, there are some parts and places in the Gallipoli where they were la where there were landings where actually tanks could have, not everyone on landing areas could have been useful, but there are a couple where they could have. And again, this goes back to the thing with Gallipoli, and we get more into this in the Gallipoli, where honestly, if more thought had been done in advance, things could have been very different. Wayne Boring, have you been getting into the East India Company supplies again? Had to pause to finish laughing. No, all I imbibe is I am broke. John South. Churchill's time as a carry officer probably helped him see the usefulness of an armoured heavy cavalry with the firepower of artillery. I think the fact that it's called the Land Ship Commission, uh, Committee tells you how and what he was interested in. John South. William Tritton was the chairman of the company during World War I, having joined the company in 1906 and became chairman in 1911 actually joined from a company called Gwyneth in the Hufosters of Lincoln, still under Triton's leadership, bought out 21 years later when they went bankrupt. But the company itself was founded in 1854 by William Foster. Hmm. Andrew Cox. The fundamental idea of a mobile protective box carrying weapons goes back at least as far as Da Vinci. Track steel and heavy machine guns, six banners, are definitely a step of mobility, armour and armour armaments, but the concept is, is the same. Mm, yes... But honestly, pushing through the concept in the nicest way there's a reason those other ones weren't built. There was no one with enough money, time, pressure pushing for them. Stafford Thompson, I've looked at 525. There is a lot of laughter going on with those emojis. Um, Andrew Cox, I have been to Gluckley. The tanks could have advanced up from the British landing site at the end of the Empire Peninsula, but once they hit the steep rough bits, they would have been going nowhere. See, Hessian matting does not appear just in World War II and various other things. And the thing is, the firepower of those tanks could have been useful. Again, it, it, it's all about planning Gallipoli. We're getting to Gallipoli another time. Fort for Chicago. Then he caught was the Iron Secret Weapon in 1915. I rate him much harder than Watts, but I also like White better than Watts, which, which goes to tell you the bench strength for the Iron Ship designers in the long 19th century. That was useful. More to talk about? There are people who spent their entire academic career just on Gallipoli. I know. I worry about them sometimes. See, Winnish. Well, a tank is a bit, a bit better than a curious. I remember reading that some still actually wore them at the start of the war, and they were not bulletproof. Uh, the unnatural melding of cavalry and cavalry ships. No wonder the first ones looked that way. Mm. John South. There was an amphibious version of the Mark IX tank, built in 1918, which pretty much just attached a load of barrels to the side until it floated. The Mark IX was also an APC that carried 30 soldiers, although considering the ride quality, lack of seats and the exhaust gases filling the thing, I doubt they would have been able to fight for at least two to three hours after leaving the vehicle. 
The Mark 9 actually did its amphibious test at the well at the Welsh Harp Reservoir on November 11, 1918. The wiki has some great photos, and you can visit the last remaining Mark 9 at Bovington. Mm -hmm. Doug M. Some of his ideas required tech that wasn't quite available at the time. Ah, mm. uh, see, Rodders, I see you've got your Churchill voice on for it. Well, it sometimes is necessary to bring the voice to bear. Oh, Richard, definitely one of Bin uh, Winston's better initiatives. True. Back to felt. Aren't you missing a cigar and a glass of whiskey, Dr. Clark? Ben Wilson. Need to drop uh, the Iron Brew and get out the Paul Roger. I'm sticking to the Iron Brew. Hashim. Aha, land ship committee. I know, in Voila get the fruit. That's why the Navy was running, because it had ship in it. Level 98 bear hunting armor. Actually, at one point, I think, uh, the Royal Navy offered to man them, and that was going to be the original reason for the Royal Navy division. The Royal Navy was going to man the land ships because the army didn't want them. <laughs> Just imagine that version of history with the Royal Navy providing the tanks. <laughs> Into World War II, the British Armour Force is provided by the Royal Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Army going, uh, we are literally just infantry, um, we no longer have cavalry even, uh, the Navy's taken everything. Level 98, bear hunting armor. Tank? What kind of newfangled contraption is this? What next? Flying machines? Hmm? Malaga. Tank said Galibli? Yes, that'd been quite interesting indeed. It would have been. Ranks butter. Dr. C, does Churchill have or do any crazy while he serves on the front line in the trenches? He, uh, let's put it this way, there are a lot of senior officers who would prefer him not to get quite so close to the front line, but he likes to, he, he believes in leading from the front. Ron Maxillian, it's Winston Churchill. The proper question is how many bottles of alcohol he had drunk that day. Hmm, possibly. And we never started on the Iron Brew. Sign me 86. The tank is one of those systems that got independently invented, conceived in multiple places. See the sign on paper of, out of Hungary. Very nearly at the same time. Yes, but the honour of it goes to the people who actually built it and get into operation the first. It's kind of like the Dreadnought. Ben Wilson. It took Hitler to inspire the land battleship. I, I'm not really sure we'll call any of those ones to be land battleships. Hey, Wils Ben Wilson. Hey, down, stay down, stay down, down, cause little Willie, Willie won't go home, but you can't push Willie around. Willie won't go, try telling everyone, oh no, little Willie, Willie won't go home. Okay. I think I've heard that before. Anyway, that's the ones for this. Goodness gracious, we got through those quickly. Bam, ba -da. So what's next? It's Gallipoli. And this is probably going to be quite a long one. <clears throat> now, Gallipoli. No, it's... Yeah, I'm still scrolling, 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 scrolling. Ah, found it, yes. John Hart. According to Andrew Lambert, Jackie Fisher gave the nod to Churchill's Gallipoli plan as it was the least worst option of Churchill's plans. Only if the Greek army had intervened on the Allied side could the Gallipoli campaign have worked. Yes and no. I do agree with Andrew. He's my old prof on that, and to an extent, that is Jackie Fisher's thing. But the thing is, Jackie Fisher was wedded with his own idea of the Royal Navy charging into the Barents, into the through the Denmark Strait, and into the um, Barents Sea. Uh, um, no, no, and no. Honestly, Jackie Fisher was just as nutty on the strategic ideas of France. I think he wanted to reenact Copenhagen at Copenhagen. Uh, <laughs> Copenhagen 3.0, 1915 style. Yeah, no, no, no. Stafford Thompson. 
I have enjoyed the series a lot, Doctor. On a major ripple, though, uh, through time, I could perceive the uh, is the re-establishment of Constantinople via Rock of Gibraltar for the Royal Navy, and what effects that would have had on the Second World War and following the Cold War, given the unrest with Turkey in the area following the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Keep up the great work. Take care and best wishes to you and the whole family. Was as always, Doctor. Hmm. Thank you. On the spot. It's been a long time gone. Constantinople. Now it's in Istanbul, not Constantinople. So if you're dating Constantinople, should be waiting in Istanbul. Sav Thompson. I think that was actually the song, a uh, uh, line from one of the songs, I think. Sav Thompson. A lot in name. If the Allies had taken the city, I could see them restoring its old name. I could see them. I could also see them handing it possibly over to Russia. There's an interesting thing for you. That's something. If the British take have to take apart the Ottoman Empire, Turkey could get what's on this side of the Straits, I on the Asian side of the Straits, and the rest could be handed over to Russia, or a Russian puppet state, as a way of keeping Russia in World War One, because suddenly they've had a huge victory that the Orthodox Church could be singing around to people. They've got Constantinople back. They have returned their Hagia Sophia to Orthodox Christendom. That might have been had an interesting ripple. Doug M. Gallipoli was a good idea of horrible execution. Way too complicated forces, the Allies and the communications today. The way they went about it was, but as I said, if they'd done some proper... Pre Look, it's the five Ps. Proper, preparation, prevents, P-I-S-S, -S, poor performance. Now, technically you're going to tell me there's six Ps, but there's only five Ps you're allowed to mention to in front of children. So, proper... Preparation prevents P-I-S-S -S, poor performance. And Gallipoli has no preparation, none of the necessary preparation or planning. None. No. So it's five Ps to anyone under the age of 16. And it's six Ps if you're teaching anyone over the age of 16 and their parents won't complain. Uh, just like Lou, I've responded to some of these. The short introduction to Russia's geopolitics brought very interesting questions. How many five-year plans did the Soviet Russia manage to intercomplete into water in two decades? However, some might think I might mock Dr. Clark. Map education, they're wrong. This is a communism, a.k.a. war communism, a.k.a. increasing class struggle, a.k.a. Stalinism, and there are uh, no propaganda or nationalistic tricks. These are real-life policies. Rever uh, reversing direction of major rivers, also fundamentally reversing understanding of genetics, try googling Lysenko genetics understanding, not to mention denial of private property and privacy. So if Comrade Stalin or any High Commissioner Authority kindly asked you to complete five years, a year or two before the initial target, you better don't hesitate. Fix your calendar, Comrade. Remember, it is totally based on scientific evidence, and if you oppose science, they have extremely scientific ways to reintegrate you or remove you as an obstacle to human progress, and it sounds familiar. if it sounds familiar to any current events, I totally disagree and condemn you, Comrade. My response to that. Um, I get what you're saying, but also the problem, as was shown in World War II, was that a lot of the five-year plans had only been completed up to the point they could be made to look complete. Not really completed. Basically, padding the figures was rampant. My own views on communism are often that it's a lovely idea, but for it to work, you need to live in a Star Trek-style utopia, where careerism is minimized, and honestly, honesty, honor, plus replicators are the orders of the day. At the moment, we need systems which retain a healthy amount of competition and cynicism to ensure the relative honesty of the leadership. Crazy Locker. Dr. Clark, I was just watching World War II channel, The Teaching's Evolution of Russian Tank Doctrine, 1919 to 1940. Very glaring examples that Dr. Clark mentioned, and what's ifs in the video. As an American, my previous education on Gallipoli and the Anzac Day me uh, meaning was Charles Lee Blackley. After you mentioned in part three, I spent an evening learning. Never knew Gallipoli was the entrance to Constantinople, as an example. Breaking out Ottoman Empire in half, lots of different dynamics in the east, uh, in the entire southeast Europe. Would it, would Italy finally form a single government, as example? Um, great mind over that, Doctor. Thank you, Jessica. Lee, Dr. Clark. In a sense, I'm afraid that you are right that this is a deadly, this is deadly dangerous, rather genocidally dangerous experiment is going to be repeated again, even before we get to the Star Trek point, because history, if anything, teaches us that it doesn't teach us anything. 
And the mantra, the real, the real communism, the lovely one, was never tried in practice, proves it for me. But don't ask me, I'm a Pole, Catholic misguided by po uh, Pope. My totalitarian government and backward society, to quote only moderate opinions in Western Hemisphere, I don't care, but is widely believed to be true. I know we are considerably wrong in every aspect. Whole libraries full of respectable scientific, uh, scientific on this papers are easily available. Ask uh, Stephen Cotton, who spent years in the Kremlin archives, and the biggest surprise to him was that Moscow Centre Communist Party Comintern was ruled by people, strongly believing that the, the idea of communism. They tried and tried again, uh, tried hard, and again and again, looked at the better Asian students coming to the Sorbonne and going back to Asia with strong commitment to it, to try it, each time for real. Cambodia, Vietnam, China, tens and hundreds of millions of martyrs for nothing in most cases. And your argument that five-year plans didn't fulfill its promise, in the nicest way, sir, I respect that you know that at least that much. In Europe, behind Iron Curtain, it's quite obvious. Yes, I try and be polite. It's not my area of specialism, but I have, over the years, done a fair amount of studying because I look into the Soviet Navy. And you look at those plans and you realise the reason they never managed to build much before they start building is because there was supposed to be huge work done on their infrastructure as part of the five-year plans. And it never delivers. It never gets there. They declare it complete, but it never quite gets there. Imagine, you have to build a ship in half of initially given time or go to Gulag. Believe me, in most cases, you will deliver a ship. If it sinks two days after commission, it will be due to interference of hostile agents, internal sabotage, Zionist conspiracy, whatever. Communist Party cannot lose face by admitting they had someone incompetent, or even better, the plan, glorious communist five years, was unreasonable. No communist ever admitted it ever. You have great chance to survive as long as it will be plausible visibly and it was ready on day requested. China is full of gigantic, impressive top tech infrastructures, bridges and highways collapsing in a few years after opening. Honestly, I can give a lot of examples from the communist world or even my home city of Gwilas in Poland, a lovely place. Uh, bridge opened when Secretary General visited and closed for technical reasons for 10 years afterwards. Also, I'm not a fan of Star Trek, so I might be wrong. But was there anything about private property in that movie? There's a lot, there is actually private property in Star Trek. That's one of the interesting things. You do have your own homes and your own courses, etc., which are your own private spaces. But, you know, you also do have replicators. Uh, Jessica Luke, again, Dr. Clark. Uh, also, I had a similar discussion in context of quality control. One of our friends was a trained, I, uh, was trained ISO system by some long time military man. His commentary was, in some room, there was even better ISO, in, uh, ISO. They called it the NKVD. True. And Bill Bond, I like your story, your bridge story. Yes, there are plenty of bridges which get magically opened for the day they are supposed to be opened for. And then get closed afterwards, even in the West. But there are a fair number in the East. And in communist countries. Doug M, love the series, thank you. Old Richard, excellent as always, thank you. And a Blackburn Blackburn, thank you. Wayne Boren, haste makes waste. Horrible waste. But an interesting take on the alternative, alternate timeline story. What would have happened? It might have knocked Germany out of the war before the American entry, which would have huge implications for the US armed forces going forward. With the armies in retreat everywhere, the German lost cause mythos might have not, not evolved, or more likely would have evolved in wildly different ways. The war would end before any high-ranking Nazis would obtain the World War I medals that made them credible. The Austro-Hungarian state might have survived and retained its warships. The Turkey might have been reduced to a rump state with the Dardanelles and area under control, a combined British, Franco, Russian control. Poland might remain part of Russia, as might Finland, possibly leading to revolts. Spanish Civil War may go the government's way, with no fascist governments in support, or may never happen. Circumstances that brought about Mussolini's rise will be changed. No idea how this will play out. If the war ends in 1917 and troops go home that year, the massive Spanish flu epidemic might have been vastly reduced. All sorts of things might have happened. True. See, Winch, welcome to the Churchill Podger Society weekly meeting. Just kidding. Interesting video. There is a big problem with somehow trying to uh, uh, tie Gallipoli into the Russian Revolution. So in 1914 and 15, they were using psychics and mediums secretly to divine the future, because history records that the Allied powers were pretty much blindsided by both the Ken uh, Keneski and Bolshevik affairs. They are publicly blindsided. In pr reality, their intelligence uh, uh, sections and a lot of the diplomatic corps are actually telling them exactly what's going to happen. They're just not paying attention to it. They don't want to, because that becomes problematic. 
We often told not to sit in our comfortable armchairs and use our knowledge of post events to judge these entrenched at the time. Why suffice? But it works both ways. We cannot inject our post event knowledge into implied motives when no inkling or evidence that such things were going to happen. And the point I'm saying is if the British take British and allies force Gallipoli and can get supplies coming up into China, into Russia, regular food supplies, regular stocks of the materials they need to fight the war, etc., suddenly things are going to be a lot better. Okay, it's the Masaryk hierarchy of uh, needs. And if you are providing people with food and your economy is stabilized because you've got the goods coming in and you're being supported and you're able to present a victory, this is the other point. If they win, and as I said earlier, maybe they give Constantinople to the Russians. If they can give the Russians a victory and they've got food and it then the government starts to look more strong. Remember, governments survive by support of the people. And yes, there are communist agitators and various persons going around agitating, but if the government is perceived to be winning the war and strong and the people are being fed and paid, then suddenly your fertile ground for your revolution might not be so fertile, or it might be a far softer revolution, in that you have to remember there are two revolutions. There is really, I would call it almost the Menshevik revolution and then the Bolshevik revolution. And it might be well that the Menshevik revolution ha takes place in a slightly more sedate fashion, maybe, i.e. the Tsar is forced to give, gra give, more, gra give more powers to Duma because of... Um, the needs of the war, and that might prevent or at least cut off the Bolshevik Revolution. It's an interesting idea to go through. The unspoken problem of Gallipoli was the same problem that also caused some other debacles in the Middle East with unsuccessful grand campaigns. You see, stuffy toffs sitting in their clubs in Alexandra, drinking gin and tonics and complaining about the wargs is one thing. It's referential, but not a real problem in terms of this war. What is a problem is when the military and political leaders allow their biases and racist views to ruin campaigns and get thousands killed because of gross underestimation of the enemy. I'm talking about a deep bias of British towards the Turks Ottomans, one where they incorrectly assumed the Ottomans were inferior and incompetent. It doesn't seem that, uh, to matter how many times they were proved wrong, they kept doing it over and over. And Churchill was one of those making foolish miscalculations based on this false racial superiority bias. I'm sorry, Steve, but that's twaddle on that one. And the whole thing is that doesn't feature in the Ottoman campaign. They do not... Let's put it this way. Uh, I forget which one of those people who's often classified as saying this says, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, uh, they'd like to talk about racial bias and all those things and racial superiority. Um, also, as quoted as saying that the ra uh, racial superiority, that a, rifle doesn't, uh, a rifle doesn't care anything about racial superiority. It just cares if there's someone to pull its trigger. Uh, I forget where the quote comes from. It's the same with the defences. Honestly, kind of falling apart and had been the sick man of Europe for a long while by this point. So it wasn't so much a racial superiority as believing the government was going to fall apart. It kind of like the modern Afghanistan government, which if anyone's talking about this is being recorded in August 2021. Afghanistan is currently falling apart again, it seems. And that's what was going through. That's what they're thinking they were dealing with with the Ottoman Empire. They literally thought, if we hit them too hard, they'll fall apart. The British have actually been shielding the Ottoman Empire for quite a while at this point because they didn't want the Russians and the French getting into the Middle East. Now World War One's happened, the Ottomans are siding with the Germans. Thank you very much for stabbing us in the back. We'll come and, uh, we'll come and take you out now. Basically the idea. Uh, Jessica Lou. Leaving the Russians somewhat aside, but not too far. I hear a lecture by a British historian, unfortunately I forgot his name and cannot find that. His point was that it was not Churchill really planned it. He was only executing policy decided by a certain committee in the British government. As I understood it, and I admit to have no deep knowledge, British deep state and very brief version of official imperial structure of power in 1915, there were two committees within the cabinet managing the state, one civilian, one military. Not really. Uh, we had a war cabinet, which did include military advisors and what involved the Prime Minister and Church and various other people. And then you had the full cabinet, which was mostly the civilian ones. You also have a committee of imperial defence in Parliament, which is basically the forerunner of the Defence Select Committee. Um, those are what's sort of running it. 
But in 1915, that after closing Russian ports and Russian grain deliveries, among other factors, was going to cause massive food prices in the in the UK. Uh, not really. Most of our grain came from Canada and America. In fact, not, and very rarely do we get grain from Russia. Most of the Russian grain goes to Europe, not to Britain. Britain tends to import it from cheaper places because we can get it more cheaply from Canada and America, which can grow on a huge industrial style. It tend to be slightly more advanced than Russia. Um, also, so Winston Churchill, Lloyd George, and all other high survived despising any mention of government regulating prices. Um, it took my part. Third, Mix Committee was set up in secret, obviously. Conspiracy was kept even before the cabinet and Churchill wasn't invited inside it. Not really. There's no conspiracy around for organising Gallipoli. No written record was, sort of, a record was allowed. Fortunately, certain lord and gentleman in its charge, also for good to was strongly committed to freedom of speech. I've never met a lord and gentleman from that period when I've studied history who was committed to freedom of speech in the British government. I'm sorry, they don't exist. Uh, wrote all about it in his conclusions to his lover, Lady. Um, I admit to have forgotten, no memory. There are, well, there's always a talk of basically, there's one cabinet minister who, um, it's always a joke is that every count uh, the sooner there was a joke from i think it was kitchener or was it from fisher who said that uh, you t uh, everything you tell to a cabinet minister will be told to their wives apart from is it lloyd george or asquith one of them who will tell it to someone else's wife there's no real secret committee there's the war cabinet and they take broadly speaking notes but they don't take great notes none british committees actually ever take that great notes after the conclusion was, after the committee estimated all possible costs and alternatives, ramping, uh, ramming through the Straits of the Black Sea and Port of Odessa was the dubious and farces. Then one day, Sir Winston simply introduced the decisions, uh, in, uh, decisions internalized it and took it as his own. Not really. And in common, in my simplistic mind, adding inside the cabinet conspiracy, deep state and train liberal liberal values, so different nowadays, understanding liberalism in Europe, mm, empire might be 150% true. Uh, look, no, uh, there are lots of historians going out there and various people who like to read conspiracy theories uh, and various things, but they don't need a secret committee. They don't. And again, they don't tend, to, there tend to be very few lords who are committed to liberalism, uh, to freedom of speech. You have to remember there are lots of people who get together in clubs and start having meetings about these things and ideas and are certain that they can influence things. There's always a strong branch of them in British society. But actually viable to actually influence anything, very few. The thing is, there's always a group who believe they can really tell well, um, politicians and those people what to do. Yes, we can, because, you know, we're the power. And they're usually very rich merchant class, uh, you know, bank uh, from the economic sort of banking side or the industrial side and lords of land. And there's always going to be groups of them who get together and start talking and think they're going to tell people what to do. What you also have to remember with Britain is there's a lot of politicians who are very happy to nod along and go, oh, that's a wonderful idea. Yes, that's a wonderful idea. You know, into my campaign fund? Great, that's a wonderful idea. And then if it's viable and actually useful, they probably already think about it, planning on doing it anyway. If it's not, then they go back uh, a few months later and go, oh, I'm sorry, you know, it's the trouble of organising the British civil service. They're just so slow. That has happened a lot in British history. The poor civil service gets blamed with so much stuff. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not too believing on that one. I'm sure there are people who've said it, but I just don't believe it. Uh, Master of the Pan Flute. Hello, I'm glad you... Uh, I would love to hear some Pan Flute music. Obviously, Royal Navy and Army were not on the same page, but a coordinated success on people of wouldn't happen until mid-World War II. Best chance to keep Russia and a giant army in the war. Um, as I've said, strongly and strange enough, once both dead together, the Kinoanish were pretty good. And honestly, they do conduct amphibious operations. This is the thing. The Royal Navy and British Army have been conducting amphibious operations for a long, long time. They managed to work pretty well together. 
Gallipoli is mucked up mostly because of not the people on the fo of uh, the place who would actually be doing it muck out. It's because of the staffs back home and various people in the ministries getting annoying. Richard Gray, baby boom historians love to revise Churchill because he was such an inspiration to their parents. Nice to see the sensible assessment of returning to his legacy. Much of what boomer historians classified as interference in World War II was probably just him pressing hard and testing his generals and admirals to make sure that they weren't the self-assured bumblers he had dealt to deal with in the course of his career, over the course of his career. I'm curious, is there any record of what Churchill thought of the R class in World War II, or a record of the advice he was given about why to push them? Be fun to compare. This was an interesting question I have going on the Gallipoli section, but I did answer it. In World War II, there are various remarks of truth to him on them but all by other people, so I would say generally he fought them bad, but how bad depends on who you do believe. Whiskey Tango Cross Sierra. Finally, someone agrees with me. I'm no longer the only voice in the vo uh, void. I'm glad. Midlu 81. The strategic idea of Gallipoli campaign, opening up Dardanelles to aid and relieve Russia was sound. The operational and tactical execution with the sign table set was terrible. Resources allocated by the Entente were totally insufficient, though. I think underestimating dismissing Turkish defences of resistance also played a huge part in the shoddy and hasty plan of Dardanelles Committee. I think they didn't actually underestimate the Dardanelles defences so much as underestimate, underestimate the Ottoman government. They thought they would collapse. They literally thought they'd just have to show up and they'd collapse pretty for some people. And it wasn't a reflection on the Ottoman people. There is often people take their remarks as meaning, oh, they're being racist. No, they think the government is terrible. They think the Ottoman government is absolutely atrocious. They're not. You, there are some who are generally racist. I, 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 I'm not saying there aren't. There are some who are generally racist, SHITs. But there are also a lot whose perception of the Ottoman government is it will collapse, given half a chance. And I would argue any historian who wants to claim that that is not a semi-accurate, at least, uh, <clears throat> assessment of the Ottoman government at that time it is being very, very kind to the Ottoman government. Um... Most of the plans from British War Cabinet, from Churchill to the Chain of Command down to the ladder, were Victorian era soldiers, accustomed to small colonial expeditions, where technology and firepower would be overwhelming, advantage against technology backward, and badly led or organised solo forces from Zulu Wars to Madis War, their fi uh, finalised in Ottoman London to Opium War to Wolsey's expedition to Alexandria. The thing is, Ottoman state corrupt and crumbling as it been for decades was not a Madis state. Zulu tribesmen that offered themselves to, si to sight some Maxim machine guns. It was more or less organised state with a regular army, some very good military commanders. Who rose the ranks by meritocracy, not by nepotism. There are some, I would agree, there are some who managed to get up from meritocracy, but there are also a large number who are nepotistic. Uh, it was their home turf and home territory they were defending that provided a huge morale motivation factor to defenders and previous military debacles of Ottoman military during invasion of Libya, by Italy and Balkan Wars, were the losses of the battles. A huge amount of territory and humiliations they endured caused a wake-up call for them to modernise and get better organised under the reformists of the young Turk government. Dismissing Ottoman military as irrelevant and inefficient was a fatal flaw for Antoine Plymouth. The, the young Turks were mostly came after Gallipoli. Tacco at four. The initial Gallipoli raid, pre invasion plans, worked amazing plan well. They smacked the absolute out of the Turks, but they had no ground troops to follow up and capture the forts and batteries. When they came back, the Turks had taken all that time to level every single fort up to 11. Pretty much. This is the thing. If the initial bat initial operation had gone in with pre-dreadnoughts, which were designed to, take, uh, to withstand mines, as said, bulges fitted and at least the forward compartments sealed up. Gone in blasted their way through, troops being landed as they went, they could probably well have forced their way to get Constantinople into Istanbul, taken that, and would have been dictating it. But that would have required you hold the ships back for at least another six to eight weeks, you bring the troops through, you cover it all up a bit, and you do some work on those ships. And you could have fitted bulges in some of the local yards, Malta, etc. Could have fitted bulges to some of those pre knots. You wouldn't have had to do a lot of them, basically four of them, the front four would have been enough. Six to eight would have been great. Middle later one. One, loss of surprise advantage due to naval bombardments in December 1914 and January 1915. True. Two, hastily done bad planning without proper intelligence. Good. Correct. 
Three, dismissal of technological advance in naval warfare. Nine, so you And instead of putting faith in, uh, and instead of putting faith to Royal Navy and the fadeable uh, legend, mm, they, it could have been done, but if they'd taken into account with proper intelligence and some time. For lack of resources and existence of resources, like amphibious training and craft, due to diversion of troops and ships to the Western Front of the North Sea and desire to conclude Diamond Skull on cheap by Entente. I would agree, yes, to an extent, but actually, amphibious training and craft, as much as they were, they were available and they were done. But uh, it would just have been a little bit more time. Getting those ships repaired and everything could have made a big difference. Five, underestimating dismissing Ottoman military resourcefulness and capacity. We're quite motivated then for the territory. I think I would agree with that. But as I said, if they had gone in December 1914, if they turned up with troops then, and they turned up with pre dreadnoughts fitted for it, or January 19, they waited till January 1915 or February 1915 with pre dreadnoughts fitted for us and all the stuff and troops, they could have done it. Race Car Meerkat. I recently read a book called Ottoman Endgame, which suggested Alexandrata as a better place to land, but it was politically impossible for the British to make a big landing in a French area. The book's naturally quite pro Turkish, but was this a sensible idea? Mm, yes and no. You can make arguments for various areas. Uh, Tobias Z. I always like the song, and the best pla uh, the band played Waltzing Matilda, which remembers the Gallipoli campaign. Ben Olsen, the writer Eric Bogle, who was Scottish, intended it as an anti-Vietnam War song. Mm, cool. Bill Bolton. Thanks, Doctor. Thank you. Maladroit. Gallipoli was a sound idea until the Ottomans turned up. It was going to go for... It was, if I was going to go for Constantinople, I would allow my force at the northern end of the peninsula, where there are good beaches, and the peninsula is very narrow. Deploy sufficient forces to bottle up the Ottoman forces in the south, and quickly marched the rest of the capital, used the battleships to bombard shore positions. As for keeping Russia in the war, the Russian people gained nothing from war. They were only glad to end the persecution when they did. Hence giving them Constantinople, perhaps. Andrew and Jane, or rather, Istanbul. Uh, Gallipoli would probably have succeeded if the RN had invested in putting bigger engines in the minesweepers so they could sweep upstream effectively. I think properly. Ben Wilson, to add to the ships that should have been saved was the River Clyde, converted to a landing ship for the Gallipoli campaign, refloated, took part in the Spanish Civil War and World War II, and survived until 1965. Hmm, cool. Steve Mikulski, I always found it curious, and to be honest, quite unfair, that Churchill's blame to degree was for this failure. I mean, I get it. He was in charge and all that. But it really doesn't seem a bad plan in and of itself, just that the plan was very poorly executed. The part and the attending, that part and the intended planning, assuming it was planning, was there? Doesn't seem to be his job, really. Isn't it the job of the Generals and the Admirals Act? I'm not really familiar with all, with all the works. I suppose it might be within the scope of his job to look over such proposed plans, but I really, I think he would have a few hundred other things he would have to deal with. I suppose I should get a book off free and read up more thoroughly on the subject in order to perhaps best answer a question that immediately erupts in my mind when I think of this action, which is, did they perform any actual boots-on-the-ground recon before they're going ahead with the OK to commit launching the assault? Nope. But that would entail more adding more titles to this. I probably don't have enough time to leave, uh, left on Earth to read. It just seems it was rushed into without too much consideration of what was being rushed into. Was it a case of we're English and they're just Turks? I don't know, it wasn't there. No, it's more a case of they're the Ottoman government. And they presume they just fall apart because it's the Ottoman government. But as said, they also underestimated the firepower of the forts. They underestimated the minefield and pretty much... They thought they could push through them, and they, did. they ended up not being able to. Um, was there a precedent for modifying ships in the way you suggest? Ha yes, there was. Um, having been to Gallipoli and seen the uh, story of the battle of the scene from the Turkish side, they considered that even the troop landings could have succeeded, except for the near societal defence put up by the on Turkish troops in the first hours. Potentially. How much of that is true, and how much is the build-up Adekert's role in the bat is debatable, but uh, what is Anomal is the familiar natural defence of the Anzacs were asked to take, and how little ground they actually took for the horrific cost. Mostly because, by the time they arrived, the defenders had all been warned that people were coming. Now, I had been planning on doing this as one massive recording, but I think I won't. I think I will do a separate recording for World War II. So, that's the answering of all the World War One questions. So this is part one of the uh, crackpot schemes or good ideas, bad execute series. 
and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to everyone who's watched. Thank you to everyone who's my patrons. Thank you to everyone who likes and shares my videos. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined this uh, channel and is subscribed through that way. Um, thank you to everyone who just, you know, watches. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. Thank you.